As New York tries to establish its legal retail marijuana market, one of the biggest outstanding challenges, in addition to the dearth of legal dispensaries, is the proliferation of illegal retail operations. And while a variety of approaches have been implemented and are under consideration during budget negotiations to address illegal sales, there is a new proposal from Democratic lawmakers that targets other licenses held by some of these bad actors. To discuss that approach, as well as other marijuana legal issues, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Fatima Afia, an attorney with the Rudik Law Group. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, David. Well, for starters, we hear a wide range of numbers get thrown out as it pertains to the scope of illegal marijuana retailers in New York. So what's your sense of the problem in the Empire State? Do you have any idea how many illegal dispensaries there might actually be here? So I don't know the exact number. I think the number has been, you know, ranging day to day. We keep getting a variety of different statistics. I wouldn't be surprised if it was somewhere in the thousands, um, which, you know, is is quite concerning. Uh, At the same time, though, I think probably the biggest contributor to the proliferation of illicit um, operators is the fact that we don't have quite enough licensed operators to compete effectively with them. I I think that's really the biggest challenge here, Um, and a number of lawsuits that have been filed over the past couple of years against OCM have been one of the major obstacles to really getting the licensing process up and off the ground running. Yeah, and as the state tries to accelerate the opening of new dispensaries, they have also reckoned with the fact that they need to try to do something in the interim about the illegal dispensaries. And one of the ideas I want to talk about now is something from state lawmakers John Zaccaro and Jamal Bailey, who introduced legislation that could impact the legal business operations of some of these illegal operators. Can you explain what their bill would do? So essentially, if you are engaging in any sort of illicit retail sale of adult use cannabis, and you are also simultaneously hold an alcohol, tobacco, or lottery license, you would lose those licenses. I I don't know that I necessarily love this approach or think that it's necessarily effective, but I understand why I've sort of gotten to a place where uh, legislators think it might be a necessary step forward. I don't know the number of illicit cannabis operators that also have any of these other licenses. So I don't know, you know, the data behind why legislators think this might be an effective road to go down, but they do see this as being one of the multiple uh, necessary steps that need to be taken in order to really get a shutdown of a lot of these illicit operators. In terms of actually implementing something like this, if it became law, how easy do you envision it would be if it was determined that a store was involved in illegal cannabis sales to remove a legal license they might have to sell alcohol or maybe tobacco products, for example? Would there be a cumbersome sort of due process that would need to be followed? Or uh, is this something where those licenses could be readily stripped away pretty easily? No, I think it would be quite cumbersome. I think each one of the license types that we're talking about that are subject to this proposal all have their own regulatory framework within which they live that provides licensees with administrative appeal processes. So I don't think any of the agencies that are responsible for alcohol, tobacco, or lottery in New York State are permitted to just simply strip away a license, I think, you know, we'll see what the actual, you know, language would be if this bill were to pass. But I think that there would have to be a lot of cross communication and transparency between multiple agencies in New York State in order to really be able to implement this. And I think it's going to take quite a number of resources and people and time and money, basically all the things that I think New York State is pretty much lacking um, in the enforcement department. You know, obviously, it's been more of a focus on OCM's resources for purposes of enforcing cannabis regulations. But I do think that there's going to be a lack of resources across the state to really implement this in a comprehensive way without violating anyone's due process rights. And so I do think that it will be quite cumbersome. Well, before we move on, let me reintroduce you for listeners just joining the Capitol Press Room. We're discussing cannabis legal issues with Fatima Afia, a cannabis attorney with the Rudik Law Group. This isn't the only proposal that's out there to address illegal 
dispensaries, so one that's been getting a lot of uh, attention from state lawmakers, Jennifer Raj Kumar and Leroy Comrie, which is billed as the quote unquote smoke out act has to do with uh, granting municipalities broader authority to essentially just close unlicensed cannabis retailers and, and then even seize their merchandise. What do you see as that potential avenue for addressing illegal sales? It's not necessarily as creative as the earlier bill, but maybe the simplest way forward is the best way forward. That one actually concerns me quite a bit for purposes of due process um, and criminal justice. We've gotten to a place in the legalization movement um, as we have in New York simply because New York State in particular, the NYPD and New York City specifically, you know, have a pretty bad track record when it comes to enforcing drug laws, um, and especially drug laws impacting people in possession of cannabis or selling cannabis. And, you know, if we look at the Rockefeller drug laws, stop and frisk, you know, New York is probably one of the worst offenders when it comes to the impacts of the war on drugs with respect to communities of color. And so I am, you know, quite concerned about giving municipalities and their local law enforcement a lot of discretion when it comes to enforcing and shutting down some of these illicit operators. You know, I do want to see a more robust licensed and regulated market for cannabis. And I and I understand the frustration that a lot of licensees and applicants have with the illicit operators, but I don't know that giving the keys to local law enforcement is necessarily the right solution. Um, and I really don't want to see a war on drugs 2.0. Governor Hochul has also proposed a similar legislative proposal, and I believe hers is actually the one that is sort of in the running right now. I think there is a final state budget that is in the works as of this week, and I believe her proposal, which is similar to the Smoke Out Act, um, but is a little bit more um, confined in terms of the authority given to municipalities, I think that's the one that's really going to be on the table for consideration and that might be implemented in the final state budget. I don't believe it would permit the seizure of products, but it does allow local law enforcement and municipalities to issue civil fines and to padlock and evict people from their shops if they are found to be out of compliance with the adult use regulations. Hers also concerns me a bit, but it does seem to have a few bit more parameters um, over the authority that is given to local law enforcement. So if there were to be, you know, one or the other having to be the path forward, I would, you know, certainly be a little bit more in favor of Governor Hochul's proposal. But, you know, I really do get concerned when we start talking about NYPD local law enforcement, you know, having, you know, a big hand in this. I think really the best solution forward for trying to I wouldn't say eradicate because I don't think we will ever eradicate the illicit market. I think it's sort of unrealistic to think that we ever could. I don't think that should even be the goal. I think what needs to happen is we need to really place all of our resources, all of our time, all of our energy on licensing people. You know, the more licensed and regulated operators that we have out there, the more effectively they can compete with the illicit operators. If you have more regulated products out there, you know, consumers are really smart these days. They do want safe and regulated products, but if there's not enough out there, then naturally illicit operators will fill in that gap. And so I think that really the best solution is to really put all of our money, all of our time, all of our resources to licensing people properly so that there is a regulated pathway and that would create, you know, a free market and some, you know, really much needed competition for the illicit operators. Well, I want to pivot away from the effort to regulate and go after the illegal dispensaries and turn to some of the regulations that are on the books for the retail market and are now being challenged in court and specifically uh, a challenge to the third party marketing rules. The marketing and advertising rules from the state have been under fire since uh, they were initially drafted and, and now they are the subject of a significant legal challenge. What is your take on this legal challenge and its chance of uh, being upheld by the court and what that could mean for the regulations that are in place right now? So the third party market regulations that you're referring to were actually struck down by a court last week. Um, The case that you're referring to is Leafly Holdings versus the Office of Cannabis Management in the state of New York. So last week was a little bit of a um, cannabis apocalypse uh, in the state of New York. Many of 
many of the uh, licensees, applicants, anyone operating in the industry, lawyers, advocates, you know, all of us were really scrambling because initially the order had actually struck down the entire set of adult use regulations for the state of New York for cannabis. Um, and it turned out to be an error that was fixed in a later amended order. But we, you know, we all were sort of scrambling, trying to understand like what this actually means for our space if we don't have any rules in place. Um, and it turned out uh, that only the third party marketing regulations that were being challenged by Leafly Holdings um, and some of the other petitioners, that those were the only regulations that have actually now been struck down as unconstitutionally vague um, and arbitrary and capricious. And essentially those regulations make it really difficult for third party platforms like Leafly Holdings. Um, these are third party platforms that will, you know, market and advertise and promote certain cannabis dispensaries and provide general information about cannabis strains and cannabis products to consumers. And it's really a marketplace for information for consumers that allows them to access certain dispensaries directly through that uh, channel. And a lot of these third-party marketing platforms would be prohibited or highly restricted from engaging with retailers and licensees in the state of New York because of some of the regulations that were challenged here. And stick around for the end of today's program when we'll finish our conversation with Fatima Afia, a cannabis attorney with the Rudik Law Group. When we pick things up, we'll learn about the state Supreme Court's initial ruling in the lawsuit dealing with third-party marketing restrictions that was brought by Leafly. And we'll also get briefed on objections to other cannabis regulations, including rules governing how close dispensaries can be to one another. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by Resorts World New York. With over 1 million square feet of space to play, relax, and celebrate, Resorts World New York City hosts more than 5 million visitors a year. That makes Resorts World a significant social and economic partner for local businesses and residents alike. Through its operations and outreach programs, Resorts World has generated more than $4 billion for the state educational system and 1,400 jobs for the people of Queens. More information at rwnewyork.com. For listeners just joining us, this is the Capitol Press Room, and we're continuing our conversation with Fatima Afia, a cannabis attorney with the Rudik Law Group. And before the break, we were talking about a state Supreme Court justice's decision to strike down third-party marketing rules, which limit the ability of companies like Leafly, which brought the legal challenge, to promote information about marijuana dispensaries. The decision is now the subject of an appeal. My feeling is, based upon the court's reasoning for why it struck down those regulations, you know, this was an Article 78 proceeding. Um, and what that means in layman's terms, it's a really expedited, short proceeding for when you're bringing a lawsuit against a state actor. Um, in New York State, you can't bring a typical lawsuit um, for just any reason that you feel like. You have to bring it through what we call Article 78. And it's basically a truncated version of your typical lawsuit and trial. Um, and so what is really interesting about this decision is that for those kinds of cases, Article 78 cases, state actors are typically given a lot of discretion by courts. And it's actually really, really hard to win a lawsuit against a state actor in the state of New York, um, as in most states. And for the court here in the Leafly decision to have struck down these regulations, you know, they came to the conclusion that the reason they had to strike them down was because the Office of Cannabis Management actually failed to provide any sort of documentary evidence as to how they even came up with the regulations that were being challenged. You know, in order to uphold your regulations as a state actor, you have to demonstrate that there was some kind of rational basis for why you implemented those regulations, how you came to those regulations. You have to talk about the staff members and the people who are involved in crafting those regulations and explain their expertise. And according to the court, OCM did none of those things. So I think if we have such a bare record for how the Office of Cannabis Management came to the conclusion that these regulations were rational and necessary for the benefit of the adult use program, then I think OCM is going to have a little bit of an uphill battle on appeal. Um, and we may see that these regulations continue to be unconstitutional yet to be seen if they'll be replaced by new regulations or if they'll just be completely struck. 
um, and won't be in effect anymore. But uh, this was a pretty unprecedented decision as far as Article 78 proceedings go. Does this case and the ruling lay the groundwork for any other prospective challenges to, say, the marketing of cannabis products, for example, letting the retailers proactively advertise their business, not just having third party platforms uh, list their businesses? So it could, it's it's all a matter of how these lawsuits are brought, because when we talk about Article 78 proceedings, another interesting and unique aspect of those proceedings is that you only get four months to bring the lawsuit from the moment that the agency determination is final. So Leafly brought this lawsuit in, I think it was September of last year, and the regulations that were being challenged were issued in August of last year. So they did it within the four month time frame that you get. The statute of limitations is only four months. And so you can't just wholesale attack regulations by OCM that were issued back in August now on their face. However, you could still challenge regulations as they're being applied today. So if the agency were to implement its regulation against a particular person today and make a, dis a final determination as to your particular circumstances based on that regulation, then those are still challenges that are viable. And the reasoning that the court gave in the Leafly decision will certainly, I think, be used in any of those challenges going forward because people are going to be able to not only demonstrate that the way the regulation was applied to them was irrational, but they'll also be able to point to the lack of a record in the Leafly case and say, OCM didn't even have any sort of rational basis upon which it even implemented these regulations from the beginning. And now it's implementing it in a way that is completely arbitrary and capricious. Um, so I do think that we are going to see additional lawsuits, um, but I just don't think it's going to be on the grand scale that some people were afraid of because we do have a statute of limitations in place. What are the chances based on your experience following state regulators in the cannabis space that they will proactively examine what they've done so far when it comes to marketing and advertising and maybe proactively make some changes that address the concerns of this lawsuit, as well as some of the broader concerns that they have about the marketing and advertising restrictions. Because from my perspective, having followed this agency through a, a number of losing court efforts, they don't seem to do a lot of introspection or, uh, or are willing to admit that they might have made a mistake. But maybe you have a different view. Does it seem like they might uh, be willing to have a, a mea culpa moment and try redrawing things proactively? So I can't speak to whether they will or they won't. I'm hopeful that they will. Um... And, and what gives me that hope is not necessarily anything that OCM has done itself to date, but more just looking at what has happened in other states. You know, the, essentially this entire market, this entire industry is still really in its infancy, particularly in New York. Um, and in every state that's legalized cannabis before New York, we have seen a number of amendments and changes to regulations either triggered by lawsuits in those states or sometimes not. Um, but we have seen, you know, an evolution of amendments and changes to these regulations all over the country. And I don't think New York will be any different. You know, I do, you know, hope that OCM will act sooner rather than later in making some of the changes to avoid and avert further lawsuits, because I think, as I have mentioned, you know, throughout the segment, I think the lawsuits that we have been filed to date have really been one of the biggest drivers for the delay in our licensing program, which in effect has also impacted the prol proliferation of illicit shops. And so I think it's all really quite related to each other. And I and I would hope that OCM would learn from the past two years or so of lawsuits, um, some of the changes that are really needed in order to stabilize this market. Um, and I think it will. I think, you know, maybe they're not moving as quickly as a lot of us would like, but I think they will because I think all regulators, you know, in any of these industries, particularly when they're still new, they do have to evolve. You know, it's adapt and pivot. That's how any industry survives is adapting and pivoting. And particularly in one as highly regulated and as volatile as this one, um, I do think OCM will 
adapt and pivot and make some necessary changes to regulations. The question is when. Well, before we move on, let me reintroduce you for listeners just joining the Capitol Press Room. We're discussing cannabis legal issues with Fatima Afia, a cannabis attorney with the Rudik Law Group. Well, in addition to the courts potentially spurring changes by OCM, the legislature could amend New York law, which would then require OCM to update regulations. Is that something that seems to be on the table at all? I know we've spoken with uh, Assembly Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes about the rollout of recreational marijuana and some of the regulations that have stemmed from that, and she's expressed concerns. So do you have any sense of whether the legislature might step in here and force uh, the hand of the regulators? So I haven't heard anything, any rumors, um, of that actually being in the works or on the table. Uh, But I wouldn't be surprised if there were amendments to MRTA that made certain changes that they would like to see in the regulations, but made them actually in the law itself, um, which would give the regulators very little option but to enforce the MRTA. Um, you know, regulators have a lot of discretion, but they do have to act within the confines of their powers, their authority, and also of the law that actually gives them that authority. And that would be the MRTA. So I do think that um, some changes to the MRTA could ultimately be something that we see in our future, but it's not something I've heard that is on the table at the moment. Well, finally, the Office of Cannabis Management has also come under fire for this so-called thousand foot rule and its impact on the location of marijuana dispensaries in really dense areas. I'm thinking of New York City in particular. What's your take on this and the potential challenges to this rule? So there actually is a challenge right now. Uh, It was filed on March 29th by a plaintiff called uh, Gracious Greens. Um, And they are challenging that rule, and they're specifically challenging it on the basis that it's arbitrary and capricious, meaning there is no rational basis for requiring dispensaries to be so far apart. Um, And also, in relation to that rule, OCM has rolled out what it has called the proximity protection map, and that is essentially a map that users should be able to access and use in order to see what locations have already been taken up by a licensee in order to determine where they're going to locate their retail dispensary before investing and putting resources into this. The problem is there doesn't seem to be a lot of transparency or clarity as to how this proximity protection map is being updated and the information that's being implemented there. It's unclear whether the license, whether these locations that are being taken up on this map are locations for people who've already been licensed or people who are still pending application review. Um, And so just by virtue of the um, lack of transparency in that process, it makes that thousand foot rule in the regulation what the plaintiffs are calling arbitrary and capricious. And I think it's a pretty compelling argument. Um, We'll see how it actually plays out in court and, you know, how all the papers that are submitted Um, really make this argument and what OCM's defense is. But I do think it's a compelling argument. There has been a lot of confusion over how this thousand foot rule is actually being implemented in practice. Um, And, you know, without that clarity, without that guidance, it does create a lot of instability in the market because the most valuable asset that licensees have is their real estate. Um, And especially in New York, real estate is hard to come by. Um, And so, you know, you don't want to invest all this time, all these resources into a property to then find out that, oh wait, it's already been blocked by somebody who's, you know, across the street or, you know, two blocks down. Um, So I do think that we're gonna see potentially some movement on that particular regulation, depending on how this lawsuit shakes out. Has a lack of transparency been a problem for stakeholders in the marijuana industry throughout the effort to set up a legalized marijuana marketplace? I think there has been some concern over transparency issues. Um, Again, I think a lot of it does stem from these lawsuits because in order to try to resolve a lawsuit, OCM will often, you know, act very hastily and either issue new licenses and additional licenses, or it will issue the regulations in a quick fashion. And I think um, by having to rush to try to resolve one lawsuit, it's actually just been creating additional lawsuits. And all of this has been creating a lot of confusion for applicants and licensees and investors in the space. Um, And so I do think that there needs to be a little bit more 
communication and open transparency with applicants and licensees about what this process is going to look like. There have been lots of hurdles, but you know we do need a little bit of reassurance um, in order to keep this market moving. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this conversation. We've been speaking with Fatima Afia, an attorney with the Rudik Law Group. Thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much for having me, David. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.